way. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he said these things to her. You may be seated. Could you pray with me? Father, we praise you because your ways are so magnificent. From the first conversation with Adam and Eve after they sinned, you start revealing your plan of redemption for your people. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Later, as we read the history of the Israelites in 2 Samuel, we see a glimpse of how this plan might be fulfilled. You promised this to King David. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your own body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him. But Father, when the kingdom of Israel falls and then your prophets are silent for 400 years, we become doubtful. But then there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And with all the wisdom of all humanity over the millennia, Father, we could not have dreamt up how Jesus the Christ would fulfill the prophecies of the Old Testament. We can only give you glory for sending your perfect son to be born as a peasant, to live a life in perfect obedience to you, to die a death in perfect obedience to you, and to keep his lifeless body in a tomb for three days. But he had spoken about the temple of his body, and after three days, no rock or tomb, or guard, or even death itself could hope to contain the Lord of life. Father, we praise you because your plan of redemption is perfect. Jesus Christ, we praise you as the king of all creation and victor over death. Holy Spirit, thank you for indwelling us and helping us to live our lives to the glory of God. We praise your name, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Could you stand and we'll sing hymn number 286.
as the glory of the risen Christ fills our thoughts and directs our worship, we're forced to consider our own inadequacy in the light of his glory. Hear what lives we are called to live from 1 John 2 and consider how far we fall short. From 1 John, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. We've heard God's word to us through his word. Let's speak back to him now in prayer. Our Father, it's impossible for us to recognize your grace if we don't first clearly see our own sin. We know that we, your children, have been washed in the blood of Christ, and yet our feet are dirty from the filthy roads of this life. God, we know that we are redeemed, but we are redeemed sinners, and this is not a tension that we can escape. So as we now confess to you the many ways in which we have trampled on your law, we don't do so in order to wallow in self-flagellation or to render us miserable. God, we do so to remind us what an awesome Savior we have. God, this morning, we have entered into the presence of a being who is powerful, who is just, and quite frankly, who is terrifying in your holiness. God, we have come to offer praises with our lips, and yet these very lips are polluted with gossip, with slander. We're here to present our hearts to you, Father, but these hearts have run after other gods. We have come to set our minds on the risen Savior, and yet our thoughts are engulfed in lust, in greed, and in pride. God, as husbands and fathers, we have not sacrificed for our wives as best we could. We've been harsh with our children. We were slow to open the Bible with our families, or maybe we didn't do it at all. As wives, we've failed to give our husbands honor and support. As singles, we've been discontent. As teenagers, we've sought refuge in amusement and self-absorption. God, as children, we have rolled our eyes at the boundaries that our parents have set for us, and we've resented them for it. As citizens of this country, we worry and we complain, and we have failed to pray for our leaders. And God, as members of local churches, including this church, we have thought more about what we can get out of it than about how we can serve. God, some of of us this week have intentionally deceived other people. Some gave in to lust and willfully viewed pornography. Some of us have overindulged in food or alcohol. Some of us have stolen time from our employers. God, some failed to speak Christ to our neighbors because we were lazy or afraid. And maybe some did speak Christ, but the next moment we used that same mouth to cut others down. We have been boastful in our own accomplishments, and yet we have been jealous of what others have achieved. God, we have treated your holy day like any other day, and we've clung to our money with fists tightly closed. Lord, some of us this week have not spent time to purposefully contemplate the price your son paid for us on the cross. Others did spend time thinking about those things, but were completely unmoved by them. God, in short, we confess that we have loved the world, despite your clear command not to. 
We have not merely lived in the world, but we have been complicit in its wickedness and its rebellion against you. How desperately, Father, we need your grace to see our own sin. How deeply we need to hear the gospel freshly applied to us every day. And so, Father, this morning we lay our arms down before you. We throw ourselves at your feet. We openly admit our corruption, and we plead the blood of Jesus to cleanse us and to wash our dirty feet once again. It is through him alone, our risen and reigning Savior, Jesus Christ, that we confess our sins, that we ask for strength to turn from them and look to you for grace and forgiveness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you're like me and you're sometimes tempted towards despair as God's holiness shines on our sinfulness, would you stand and hear encouragement from God's Word? Christian, know that if you believe in Christ, your sins are forgiven and we do have life. From the Gospel of John, chapter 20. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Amen. Does this promise amaze you that by believing, we may have life in his name? You're not alone. From the Apostle Paul, writing to Timothy, Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. Let's worship our Savior together, number 276.
it to you. Would you pray with me again? Father, we thank you for the beautiful sound of our brothers and sisters singing in this church. We thank you for the beautiful sights of spring, that magnolias are blooming, and so many other trees and shrubs that strike us with their vibrance and beauty. Thank you for how it lifts our spirits especially on this Resurrection Sunday when our spirits are full of hope as we remember Jesus' resurrection. But in the midst of cherry blossoms and roses and tulips, we often see thorns and fallen trees. In the midst of joy, many suffer. On Good Friday, we saw four women from our church who have especially suffered this year snuffing out the candles in this sanctuary. God, these women are just a small sampling of the suffering you have called this church to over the past year and more. In the midst of suffering, Father, remind us, this is not a shallow weekend to celebrate bright colors and fake smiles and half-baked photo ops in hopes that those things will maybe make us feel better. No, this weekend, Remind us that the Son of God suffered in agony, taking our sin on himself as he bled to death in excruciating pain. That is why we have such joy today, because he understands our pain, and Jesus' rising from the dead is just the first fruits of what we will experience when our bodies are pulled from the ground 
and made perfect in heaven. Then we will have every tear wiped away and every smile will be full of pure joy. Until then, Holy Spirit, be a comforter to those weeping. As some here could care less about the news and as some undoubtedly lose sleep thinking through political arguments, we pray either way for the leadership of our state and country. We pray for our governor. We pray for our president, both of whom you have put over us. And in the words of the Apostle Paul, we pray for all who are in high positions that we as Christians may lead a peaceable and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. We pray for the leaders of this church who you have also put over us, Bless our elders with energy and with wisdom and keep them far from temptation. Bless Pastor Steve. Bless Pastor Steve and the elders' wives, if the elders are married, as the ones who often bear the brunt of their husbands' meetings and committees. Bless our deacons with faithfulness to their calling. Help them to have joy when it feels like they're going from their day job right to their second job when they have a busy day with work and with deacon work. Bless this congregation, Father. For those who are Christians here today, fill them with your Holy Spirit. Give them a level of joy they have not felt. Give them wisdom in their pursuits and make them more like yourself than they were yesterday. For those here who would not call themselves Christians and maybe are wondering why on earth we would close our eyes and talk out loud, Reveal yourself to them and call them to yourself. Have mercy, Lord. We pray this in the name of our risen Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.
Amen. Could you stand, please? We'll sing hymn number 277. Years ago, my wife and I were on a plane to Israel. We were going there to study for a January term in Jerusalem, the, the topography and geography and the history of Israel. And on the way, we learned we would have a little time in Switzerland. 
I'd always wanted to see Switzerland. I had probably wanted to see Switzerland more than I wanted to see Israel. And so we learned as we were a day or two before, we'll be landing and you'll have a whole 24 hours in Switzerland. So what do you do? Rent a car and drive to the first three miles of the Swiss Alps? Go to a grocery store and buy some Swiss chocolate? You hardly have time to do very much, but maybe you can do one thing that you could remember from that country that was different from your own. Now, in our passage today, which is going to be from the last chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, a similar thing is true. There is so much in this little passage about what happened after the resurrection of Jesus Christ that you'd love to stay for a long time and linger on it. But we can only just pick one theme that runs through it, if you would. So if you see things that we miss in this passage, it's because we have 24 hours in Switzerland. So let's see the bottom of the Alps or buy a little chocolate. <clears throat> the theme today is about what sort of person does Christ's resurrection from the dead help? And what sort of person does that resurrection harm? Here's the background before we actually read it. Earlier in the chapter prior, Jesus had died and has been buried in the tomb of a wealthy sympathizer who had an enormous rock tomb. This was not a hole in the dirt, as I say, but one hewn into the side of a rock hill with a ledge carved into a wall, and it's closed off by a door of sorts, but not a rectangular door and a hinge. As you've probably seen the pictures, it's closed off by a stone wheel, an enormous round wheel, flat on each side round, and it rolls down a trough, a slight incline. It is hard enough to get the stone in position to roll it down. It is extremely hard to roll it back up. It would take the effort of a number of very strong men. That is where Jesus lay. Now, the next day, the Jewish leaders went to Pontius Pilate, the governor of Roman Syria. The meeting there was of the people of the highest status. Pilate was not just some Roman bureaucrat. He was the Roman governor with the absolute power of life or death over all his subjects. And the Jewish religious leaders that went were not mere delegates, but they included the chief priests, that is, the top religious and political leaders, and the former priests that were like former presidents today. That's how high they were. And all these men who were the highest that you could get in Israel. They went to Pilate, and they said, we remember that when that deceiver was alive, he had promised that he would rise from the dead three days later. Now, the Jewish leaders feared because they had learned that Pilate had given access to the body of Christ once he had died to a sympathizer of Jesus. And that got them to thinking, my goodness, maybe his disciples will come, steal the body away, and therefore spread the rumor that he's risen from the dead when we all know that he's really stone cold dead. And it will start rumors, and those rumors will lead to a resurrection of messianic fervor and cause all kinds of problems for Rome and all kinds of problems for us. And therefore, sir, we are asking that the tomb be secured. Now, they did not mean mechanically secured. It was already wonderfully mechanically secured, as we've said. But they were asking it that it would be secured with legal force. That is, with some kind of notice that if you open this tomb, you will have Rome to deal with. And the Jewish leaders added this motivation to Pilate, doubtless. Sir, you know how when this man got to preaching, he stirred up crowds, and you don't need riots. And particularly when word gets out, he thinks he's the Messiah. You don't need some other alleged king claiming the throne that only Caesar sits on. As a result of that, Pilate gave them a guard. Now, there are some people think, and, and there are a decent amount of arguments for this, that what he gave them were not Roman soldiers, but he allowed them to take their own Jewish temple police as guards. As I say, there's some good arguments for that, but it seems to me the arguments are better that he gave them Roman guards, which would make their standing there all the more official and intimidating. 
And so the Jewish leaders accompanied Roman guards. What a fascinating collection and combination of people. And they went to that tomb, and they strung a rope over it, and they pressed wax into it and, or clay, and they sealed it with the most officious-looking seal. There, therefore, was an intimidating armed attachment of men nobody's going to mess with. Now, in our chapter, chapter 28 of Matthew, in the verses before our passage, we read the famous account of the resurrection of Jesus, which no human being witnessed. He they witnessed him after he had raised from the dead. Very early on the third day, we read, was a violent earthquake. And what's interesting, it says that this earthquake was caused by a single angel coming from heaven whose appearance was like a flash of lightning, and he, by himself, rolled away this stone, and the guards collapsed unconscious. At some point, they woke up, having been scared to death, and they fled the scene. Not long after the guards are gone, some women who had dearly loved Jesus while he was alive came to the tomb. The same angel is sitting there, but now in a little less frightening mane, I would say. And the angel says, he's not here. He's been raised from the dead. Tell his disciples to go north to Galilee, and he will see them there. As they're leaving, Jesus himself meets them. Don't be afraid. It really is me. Tell my disciples I will see them in Galilee. And so now we come to our passage, Matthew 28, beginning with verse 11. Now, while the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, you are to say his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this report, guards, if this report gets to the governor, that is to Pilate, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money, and they did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews until this very day. That is the day when Matthew wrote many years later. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and in earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, even till the very end of the age. That's the account. Here, two groups are being trans contrasted, I would say, in two different paragraphs. One group that does all they can to avoid the resurrection of Jesus Christ and will ultimately be harmed by that resurrection. And another group who are doing everything they can to embrace the resurrection of Jesus, and they will be greatly helped by that very resurrection. Now, here is what the people did who tried to avoid the resurrection. First, let's consider the guards. After fleeing in terror, waking up from their fainting fit with the angel, they collected themselves. Some of them went to the city, and we read not that they went to Pilate, but they went to the chief priests. They had requested an attachment. The reason they went to the chief priests, it seems, is that even though they were Pilate's soldiers, they had been assigned to help the Jewish authorities. So there they went. Now, the leaders could have had the guards punished. Pilate could have had the guards punished. But the leaders, actually, and Pilate both, needed these very soldiers. They needed them to explain why the tomb was empty, which was an extreme embarrassment. And so, here we have what the guards 
were doing. Now, the Jewish leaders, what they did was they concocted the story. The story they concocted was, of course, that the guards slept and the disciples stole the body. Now, this shows the desperation of the priests, if you think about it. Were all the guards sleeping, really? And if so, well, how did they know that it was the disciples who stole the body? And if even one guard was awake, why wouldn't he alarm all the other ones and have the disciples arrested? If the, the Sanhedrin, the Jewish Supreme Court, the court where all the leaders assembled, if they had a shred of evidence against the disciples, they would have had the disciples arrested, but they had none, so they're just grasping at straws. But somebody must develop a narrative, and so instead of having the guards punished, they pay off the guards a substantial sum of money to spread the story. Now, we read in verse 12, it was a great sum of money, and doubtless it had to be, because it would be humiliating at the very least in order not to have been awake at your post. So, Matthew says the guards did as they were instructed, and that the story the disciples had stolen the body was circulated until the very day that Matthew wrote his gospel. Now, we learn from this passage the kinds of things that tempt people to avoid the resurrection of Jesus Christ, both in that day and in ours. For instance, it's clear that the value of reputation, personal reputation, and luxury greatly tempted people here to avoid coming to terms with the resurrection of the Son of God. Think about it. In Jewish society, the most powerful group of people, as I've said, is a group called the Sanhedrin. They're known as the, like the Supreme Court of the nation. All the religious questions are settled by them ultimately. They can expel you from the synagogue. They settle all legal questions in the nation that comes because there was a merger of church and state in their, uh, in their country. Their composition, as I said, was the high priest, who was the very greatest authority. And then, since it talks about the chief priests, it also included the former high priest, just like we would include former presidents among those honored in our country. And then there were elders, that is, heads of the tribes of Israel. And then there were scholars called teachers of the law, or in some version called the scribes. These people were moneyed. These folks were educated. These folks were very well connected. The parties they went to, you would not be invited to, probably. Their homes were never in the valley portion of Jerusalem because the hot air was too great there in the summer. Their homes were high on the hills and prominences so that you could catch the breeze. That's where all the rich folks were. How they loved the importance of being able to make decisions that infected the entire country. How they loved the way that heads turned and they drew glances whenever they entered a room or walked down a street. They adored the deference that was shown to them by others, the titles by which they were called, the seats of honor that they were given at the banquets. These were the things they relished. Now, if anyone would have had opportunity during the lifetime of Christ to see His power and have some reason to believe that he was indeed the promised Messiah. It was these folks. Workaday people have to go to work all day and sweat. They can't leave. They're beholden to their bosses. But the people in the Sanhedrin, they set their own schedules. No one questioned how they spent their time. They could go anywhere they wanted at any time. They could send subordinates to listen to Jesus preach and hear reports about the miracles he did. Well, they could go themselves because it was easy for them to arrange accommodations when traveling. It doesn't matter how far away he was. These people saw the withered hand of the man become straight in the synagogue. They watched the demonized lunatic, totally changed by Christ, sitting with his hands folded on the chair, pretty much like a kindergartner waiting for the first day of school. If anyone had reason to believe, they did. They lived in Jerusalem, only two miles away from Bethany, where it was incontrovertible that Lazarus had been raised from the dead. People were there in Solid who lived in Jerusalem. But it was so offensive 
for them to think that this man was the Messiah and to yield to him because he called them to repent like all the unwashed people of this country. It was so embarrassing that this man bested them in debates about the Scripture in public, no matter how much they studied, clearly he won every debate. And it was so frightening that if he were claimed to be the Messiah, the crowds would swell, riots would start, and the Romans would come crashing down on the Jewish nation as supporting some other king other than Caesar, and these highbrow, high-placed people would lose their positions of privilege. So, because of their wounded pride, because of their love of all eyes turning to them, because it was inconceivable for them to part from the lifestyles to which they were accustomed, because they couldn't bring themselves to lose these things, they could not bring themselves to consider that Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah and that he was truly raised from the dead. And so, in an act of insanity, because they killed a person who had raised three other people from the dead publicly, now they denied to themselves that he could possibly himself have been risen from the dead, and so they parted with the golden shekels that they loved to pay hush money to shaken guards. And by that, they bought their own comfort, they bought their own position, and by that, they bought their own place in hell. In summary then, prestige and luxury are two of the main things that tempt a person to avoid thinking about the resurrection of Jesus. There are doubtless many things that tempt people, but we'll just mention one other one that's in this passage. Fear of the supernatural tempts many people to avoid thinking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We see this beginning back in, in chapter 27, the chapter of four hours. These were military men who were told to guard the tomb. They were not softies. They were used to a Spartan life. They were used to dealing with rough crowds. They were not easily spooked. And yet, when they encountered an angel, the supernatural so shook them that they virtually wet themselves. We read that the light that shone from the angel, as I say, was as bright as lightning, and it had a holy, I don't know what other word to use other than a holy otherness to it, something far beyond this world they sensed. This was in a dimension they had never seen or thought about, some realm beyond, and it scared the willies out of them. Simultaneously, they felt the earthquake. I have never been in a serious earthquake. I've just felt the slightest tremor in Baltimore growing up one time that hardly rattled anything. But I'm told that people who have lived through serious earthquakes sometimes feel for the rest of their lives they can never feel totally comfortable or settled that the solid ground under their feet won't open up and shatter buildings and swallow them up. And so these men, scared out of their minds, well, here's how scared they were. Matthew, in writing this in the language that he wrote, he uses the same word in two different places. He says, there was a great earthquake. And then he says, the guards quaked for fear, and they became like dead men. That is, they totally fell unconscious out of fear. And when they woke up, they just crawled away and ran for their lives. In the presence of a supernatural, they faced this choice. Here's the choice they faced. These men had to know there's some reality about another world a higher world, a supernatural world. There has to be some deity behind this being who has just come down and scared them so, frightened them so. There is a God. The man in that tomb is obviously in some way connected with that God. What they should do is to say, my goodness, I need to hunt down these disciples of his and talk to them and say, Somehow, I need to get on the winning team here because I feel like I'm on the losing team. But instead, their fear that they should have had of how to meet God was instead a fear, get me out of this place. And they preferred 
the safety of what was common and seen to what was uncommon and unseen, and they preferred the bribe money that they later received to the riches that they would gain in heaven from learning who this Jesus was. Now, in modern times, we also have people who deny the resurrection for the same sort of reasons. Um, a generation or two ago, throughout most of the 20th century, even the late 18th century, 19th century, you had churches, theologians, ministers, clergymen denying that the resurrection of Jesus Christ was a literal event, going to great, I don't know what you could call it other than interpretive contortions to try to make the Bible say something it wasn't. Just as Jesus walking on the water was really that he knew exactly where the stones were that he could step on and things like that that any six-year-old would say, really? So the idea that Jesus' resurrection was literal was totally dismissed because it was uncomfortable. And the great theme was it wasn't a resurrection of his body, but it was the resurrection of his hearts and his dream and his soul. And it is the beginning of the resurrection of his life in ours. And this kind of, I don't know what else to call it, but mush language that was very big in the last century. For people who are uncomfortable with the resurrection, that outright denial of the resurrection of Jesus still exists to some extent, but it's far less common. What is far more common today, the way people avoid the resurrection is as follows. Today, church leaders and pastors, and I mean all over the country and all over at least the Western world, they don't necessarily deny the resurrection. Many of them just ignore it. Let's not talk about it. Because a God you can ignore is just as good as a God who doesn't exist. But many church leaders don't ignore it. What they do is to take the word resurrection and they redefine it. I learned this firsthand about a year ago. This time last year, I was still recovering from knee surgery at home. I couldn't, couldn't come to church, and so I'd watch from live stream, and that was the first time I really had ever watched any sermons live stream in my life. So on Easter Sunday, after watching the service here, I thought, I, I'll just check another one out. So I just went online and, and, and typed in, you know, Easter services, found some church. I, I believe it was a Presbyterian church. I, I'm not sure. I can't remember exactly what city. I think it may have been in Nashville, Tennessee, but it could have been almost anywhere. I thought I'd listen to the service. There was the service. There were hymns. And then the pastor got up and spoke. She was a good speaker. She was easy to listen to. She was articulate. She opened with a little story. It was interesting. She, you didn't have to, have to wade through it with boredom. She kept your attention. And she talked about the resurrection of Jesus. And isn't it wonderful that Easter is all about a resurrection? Think, she said, about the resurrections all around us. Now, believe me, Jesus Christ literally risen from the dead in order to be the Lord of the living and the dead was long gone in her sermon by this time. What she was talking about was... Easter is about resurrection. Folks, she said, open your eyes to the resurrections all around you. For instance, I know a young man who was hooked on drugs. He was in institutions. He lost his job. He, he, he lost his friends. He lost his money. He was lying in the gutter. But he got help. He got therapy. Friends walked with him. And now he's off of drugs, and his life has been resurrected. I know a married couple, she said the husband and wife, but they grew apart, they grew distant, they got to irritating each other, it broke into fights, and they separated, and their marriage was an absolute shambles. But instead of just wallowing in that, they went and got helped, and through counseling and therapy and friends and psychologists and so forth, their marriage was brought back together again. You see that now they've experienced the resurrection from the dead. This is the way that a great many churches in the whole Western world, as I say, interpret the resurrection. It's not about Jesus Christ. Often these churches call themselves progressive Christian churches. Well, why do people do that? The reason folks ignore the resurrection today or two millennia ago are largely the same. If you focus on the literal resurrection of Jesus Christ, you must come to terms with the supernatural. 
And you must come to terms that the supernatural is of a far higher level than you, of a level that you can't control, that you can't be the master of, that you can't easily manipulate, that you are dealing with a man who was God, who is higher than you, to whom you are accountable. And therefore, you must go back to the Gospels and see all the things that this God-man Jesus had said during his lifetime. And if you do, you will realize that he talks about peace and he talks about forgiveness. He does. But he also talks about sin and accountability and the need to repent and that he will receive you, but that your hearts must change in this regard. This is extremely uncomfortable for ancient people and it was extremely uncomfortable for modern people. And therefore, Rather than have a God I cannot tame, rather than have a God who tells me how I must live, rather than have a God who says I must come through a narrow door of repentance and trust in Jesus' death in order to reach heaven, I find this intolerable, and I will dismiss the resurrection as something symbolic and theoretical and irrelevant to me. Now, to the people of Jesus' day, And to the people of our day, dismissing and ignoring and explaining away the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth feels safe. We see in this text, the priests said to the guards, look, take this money, tell the story we gave you, and if this comes to your superiors, we will keep you out of trouble. What you're doing is safe, they said to those men. Pilate, doubtless, the Jewish leaders would go to him and say something along the lines of, Sir, we will handle this. The Jewish leaders think that the money they paid out to spread the story that Jesus had not raised, the Jewish leaders think that this will make their position safe. It will quell the rumors that there has been a Messiah who is actually back from the tomb They will begin another narrative that is stronger than the narrative that the disciples are going to be saying. And they are just thinking the ultimate danger for us is to lose our position, and we are doing everything we can to buttress ourselves against it. But avoiding the resurrection of Jesus Christ in any way that one does is not safe. The leaders of the Jewish people were not safe. They have been shamed before the entire world in every generation between then and now for 2,000 years. Their stories are read and their persons are dishonored. Pilate and the Romans were not safe with the notion that Jesus had not risen from the dead. Pilate himself, not many years after this, was dismissed from his position, for mishandling an incident. He was relieved of it. He was sent back to Rome to answer to Caesar. Christianity eventually conquered the Roman Empire, not with the sword, but with the truth of the gospel because all power has been given to Christ and that gospel would go to all nations. Friends, no one is safe by dismissing the resurrection. All of us, everyone, myself very much included, will stand before Jesus Christ, the risen Lord, in all his glory as the judge of the world. His brightness will make the brightness of that angel seem like night. Believing in Jesus Christ, in his atoning death, and in his resurrection from the dead is the only truly safe place in the world. And so we find the disciples in the last paragraph of our text in verses 16 and following. And by the way, the the New International Version reads, then the 11 disciples went to Galilee. I don't think it should be translated like that. The ESV translates it also, what you could translate it is, now the 11 disciples went to Galilee. I think the word should be translated in the normal sense of that word, but the 11 disciples went to Galilee. Matthew, I think, is contrasting what the disciples are doing to what Pilate and the guards and the Jewish leaders did. Oh, my goodness. 
But the disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. They obeyed his instructions. They obeyed his instructions because they trusted that wherever he would take them, it will be okay. So they go to Galilee where Jesus said to go. Galilee, the place that the Jewish leaders despised way up in the north of Israel because they don't have as much religion as we have here in Jerusalem. They're spiritually inferior. That's where Jesus, the Savior of the world, would meet his disciples. And there they went to the mountain that he specified. And we read in verse 16, they worshiped him as the risen Lord. Did the disciples have any questions as they worshiped him? Well, yeah, sure. How do we relate to him now? He's different. What will life be like with him as risen from the dead? What will his kingdom look like now that he's the king and he's risen, but the end of the world hasn't come and Rome still ruled, and the evil was still in the world, and he has said that he's not going to remain with us for long. What will it be like when he goes back to heaven? They have all these questions, and yet they worship him. Did those disciples who worship him have any hesitancies? Oh, for crying out loud, yes, they did. We read in verse 16 that some of them actually doubted. They worshiped him. Some doubted him. Can you even put those two things together? I know you can put them together because putting those two things together is probably true at some time or another of every single Christian in this room. Is it not? You believe in Jesus. And yet sometimes, well, as, as one person said, you know, Christianity is, is, is a combining of our worship and at times of our doubts. Yeah. Now, it's interesting that they doubted because these 11 disciples the other Gospels make clear, had all seen the risen Christ, Christ at least twice before Galilee. Peter had seen him at least three times. But I think what makes them doubt and have hesitancies, a resurrected person is just rather incredible to rub shoulders with and to believe your eyes. And Matthew, who was one of the 11, is unashamed to say that a number of them doubt it. Christians, as someone has said, live their lives between worship and doubt. And yet these disciples, their move, as one person has said, from unbelief to faith, their move from unbelief to joy was hesitant. It was slow, but it was real. And as best they could, they put their trust in him. And so... What Jesus said to end this is, he said, Brothers, I have been handed by my Father the keys to the universe and to everything beyond. What he said literally was, All authority has been given to me <clears throat> on earth and in heaven. By all authority on earth, he's telling them, All your lives. I personally will control whatever happens to you. Nothing will ever happen to you that I have not ordained and allowed so that even the difficult things that happen to you will be for your ultimate good. And all authority has been given to me in heaven. And the significance of that is I hold the keys to the doors of paradise. I bar those who refuse your words as you preach about me and I will admit to heaven, you and everyone else who comes to trust in me because of your words that you will say. And therefore, Jesus ended by saying, with this in mind, go. Tell the world who I am. Make disciples of all nations. And by the way, surely I will be with you always, even until the very end of this age. Could I ask that we would all bow our heads and ponder these things a moment and think particularly of your relationship to the resurrection? Is it a believing one that will help you? Is it an avoiding one that will harm you? And consider seriously the welcome of Jesus that he will receive anyone who turns to him.
Father, thinking of how many people are in this room, how many perhaps believe in you but find their faith very weak and wobbly this day. Please strengthen those of us in that boat. Father, for those of us in the boat that we tend to resist thinking about the resurrection because it makes us uncomfortable, would you give those dear people the grace to ponder you, to believe in you, to repent and turn to you, and have the joy of sins forgiven and of Jesus as their Savior and of you as their Father. Amen. Shall we close by standing and singing a final hymn of praise? to him who was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised for our justification. To this congregation, blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord. Amen.